Good morning. Let's take a deep breath as we prepare to receive the word. This morning's scripture comes to us from the book of John, chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. Good morning, beloved. My name is Vito. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm really glad to see each one of you here. Glad to see some new faces. Also glad to see those of you who have been a part of this community for a long time. If we haven't had a chance to meet, I'd love to say hello to you uh, after the service. In a couple of weeks, about two weeks' time, there's going to be something going on here in New York City, and it's going to be going on all over the world, and it's the Feast of Sukkot or the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles. It's one of the three festivals that's commanded in the Hebrew Scriptures for Jews to celebrate. There's instruction given for all three of these. Sukkot is celebrated now. You, you, you'll see it around the city. You'll see it in places like Williamsburg or South uh, Brooklyn where there are a lot of Hasidic folks. You'll see these booths, these sukkahs that folks will come out into and to feast in and sometimes even sleep out there. The reason that they build those is twofold. Sukkot is a harvest festival. It's a celebration of God's abundant provision for his people in the, in the, in the harvest of the fall. It's a little bit like a Thanksgiving sort of celebration. And so these booths are meant to emulate the booths that farmers would live in for those couple of weeks that the work was really coming in strong and they had to live out there right next to the fields. That's part of what those booths are about. Those booths are also about connecting people's minds and hearts to that journey that was taken from Egypt all the way to the promised land when they didn't have a place to stay when they were on the move, they were in the wilderness. And so it's a reminder that God's people are a pilgrim people. They live in booths, they're just set up wherever. So it's these two things that people nowadays celebrate Sukkot and this is how they commemorate it. I wanna tell you what it looked like 2000 years ago when people celebrated Sukkot, when they celebrated in Jerusalem, this is what it looked like. You would go into the temple, everybody would be gathered there on the first night of Sukkot. And there in the court of women, there are several concentric circles in the temple. And the one that everybody could get to was the court of women. And there in the court of women were four giant lanterns. They were 70 feet tall. And at the very top were four big pools of oil. And the wicks that were used for these enormous lanterns, these torches, the wicks were the clothes of the priests that had been worn that year. And at the beginning of Sukkot, the first night, the priests would put ladders up on top and they would climb up and they would light these lanterns and this enormous celebration would begin. We have historical accounts of what it looked like. 
And some of the accounts say that all of Jerusalem's courtyards were illuminated by these four enormous lanterns. I want you to think about what that would look like in a pre-electric culture, those kinds of lights. Do you know why they lit those torches? It was to remind them of something that took place. It was to remind them that when they were released from Egypt, when they were freed from their slavery, and when God took them to the promised land, he led them. He led them with a pillar of fire. At night, they were protected and guided by this pillar of fire. And so when these lanterns were lit, it was a reminder, God protects us. God guides us. These these stunning and outrageous enormous lamps, this fire blazing above them was a reminder that God is a pillar of fire and he guides them this overwhelming light. It was at this festival where Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. It was in the temple at Sukkot that Jesus says this. This gives you a little bit of a context That when Jesus stands up and says, I'm the light of the world, he didn't do it in a vacuum. He didn't do it randomly walking from one place to another. He says it in the midst of the temple so that he can point out to all the people that are there. Do you remember that light that led you? Do you remember the light that freed you from slavery? Do you know the light that shines and provides everything that you need when you're on the way? I'm the light of the world. I'm explaining this to you so that you'll have some sort of context for what this means for the Jews who would have first heard it. Jasmine read that scripture. Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. That's the context. Now, what's the context for you and me? When you hear the phrase, the light of the world, what do you think of? You might think of Jesus. If you're a Christian, you grew up with this stuff, you would think, well, I'm thinking about Jesus. But what you also might think about when you think of the light of the world is the sun. The sun, which is the light for this world that provides life, It's not so close that it will burn us up. It's not so far away that it leaves the earth cold and dark. It's what brings life. It's what brings provision. There is no harvest. There is no food. We also might think of, you and I might think of the light. We think about the light is what exemplifies compassion and wisdom in somebody. If you think about somebody and you say they're living in the dark, what you mean is they do not know what's going on. They have no compassion. They have no love. They're living in the dark. Or you might know somebody, maybe this has happened to you, maybe you're going through this right now, and you're living life, and you look in somebody's eyes, and you say, there's no light in their, their eyes. There's no light. There, there's something wrong. There's no spark. All of those contexts that we have, God's provision, the sun, and the wisdom and compassion of, of righteous living, and then, and then the hope that we have, think about all those contexts, and again, Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. What makes life possible and what makes wisdom and compassion possible and what makes hope possible to to think that you want to live one more day? He says, I'm the light of the world. And so when he says this, I want us to be able to hear it in all these contexts and I also want us to hear it as an invitation because that's what it is. I'm not just giving you this data so you can say, oh, that's interesting. That's okay. I didn't know that. I'm telling you this because when Jesus says he's the light of the world, it's not in the passage that Jasmine read, but it's in uh, one chapter previous, in John chapter 8. Jesus says, listen now, this is being spoken to you by Jesus, not just me, but Jesus too. I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's an invitation from Jesus to you. He wants you to follow him so that you won't walk in darkness and so that you'll have the light of life. He wants you to see him and follow him so that you'll be provided for, so that he'll be a pillar of fire to you. And Jesus believes that it's a matter of life and death that you would do that. So what I want to do now is I want to walk through this passage that Jasmine just read. And it comes to us from the Gospel of John, chapter 9. And now, if you've ever read the Gospel of John, it's, it's fairly long, and it's like a great symphony. It's like this beautiful, profound, intricate, simple, life-giving symphony. Each of the chapters is sort of like a movement in the symphony. We're only doing one section of one movement. I hope that tonight maybe you'll get your Bibles out and you'll read through chapter 9. 
I'm just going to take us through a few verses. So if you'll flip, if you brought your Bibles, that's great. Turn to John chapter 9. If you didn't and you have your little bulletin, let's take a look. If you'll turn over, I just want to walk line by line through uh, what we can learn about Jesus as the light of the world here. The first verse says, as he passed by, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. This is the first verse. Let's just stop right here. We're talking about the light of the world. We're talking about the one who's the creator and sustainer of all things. But I want to just pay attention to some little details. What does Jesus do? He passes by. This little incidental detail, he passed by this man. This man does not come to him. Sometimes in the Bible, people come to Jesus because they want something. That is not what is happening with this guy. Jesus passes by him. There's some intentionality here that Jesus decides to go to him before he even asks, before he even knows that that's something that is going to be helpful for him. If I could use a really simplistic kind of bad analogy. Do you guys like bad analogies? Do you like those? Okay, I have one. Okay, here's my bad analogy. Okay, you get home from work and you think, I do not want to cook again. And then you go on seamless. And you start flicking through and you're like, I don't want any of this stuff. I've had all this stuff. It's not very good. And you keep flicking through and flicking through. And when that happens to me, I start thinking about some of the really good restaurants that I've been to. And I think to myself, I wonder if that place that I've been to that's really far from here, would they deliver? Does that really fancy restaurant deliver to me? Do I really have enough money in my bank account to justify ordering from this place? And imagine if I was flicking through that and all of a sudden there was a knock on my, I, there's no knock on anybody's door in New York. The buzzer rings and the buzzer and all of a sudden they say, it's here. You say, what's here? The meal is here from the place that you wanted, the best place, the most nurturing place, the most nourishing place. That's what's going on here. Before this guy can even ask, before anything happens, Jesus passes by, and it's not, it's not something that's happening happenstance. Passes by just seems like a guy's just kind of walking around Jerusalem. Jesus just does not walk around Jerusalem. He walks with such intention. And one of the places you can see this is in John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, there's this couple of verses that scholars have been puzzling over for a very long time. And it's that Jesus is trying to get from Galilee to Judea. And it says in John chapter 4, he had to pass through Samaria. That's not true. You do not get to Galilee to Judea through Samaria. But it says that Jesus had to pass through Samaria because he had someone to see there. He had an appointment with a woman who was struggling and who was in trouble. And he had an appointment with her that she did not know about, but he did. This is how Jesus moves in the world. He has to pass by people that he sees and that he knows need his light and need his life. And I'm telling you that because it's the same for you. It's not that God's power or God's grace or God's love is just kind of out there banging around in the universe and it might hit you. Jesus moves with such intention and such will. He's the light of the world that has a will. You know, the sun, well, it's not out today, so this is another bad analogy. These are my favorite kind, are bad analogies that don't really land or come home. So those are the kind that I prefer. Um, when the sun is out, and the light might pass by your face, you know it's just kind of random. You know it's just sort of happening, like, whoa, there it did. That is not how the light of the world comes to his people. It's not how the light of the world is going to come to you and has already come to you. He comes with intention, and he passes by because he wants to be with you. That's true for every single one of you. But here, let's look at just one more incidental little word. When he passes by you, what does it say? He saw the man blind from birth. He saw him. And you think, well, that's just, okay, that's de rigueur. It's, it's, it's obvious. He sees him. It's not obvious. And here's why I know it's not obvious. Towards the end of this passage, actually, it's in verse 8. If you go down to verse 8, will you look at that? Jesus passes by and he sees this man. Is he the first person that's seen this man? No and yes. In verse 8, it said, the neighbors and those who had seen him before is a beggar, we're saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said it's he, others said no, but it's somebody like him. Nobody knows this guy well enough to say whether or not it's him. 
They've seen him, they have not seen him. They know him, they do not know him because he's just become part of the scenery. He's part of something that they just kind of walk by. Jesus does not just walk by, he sees this person. And this should not surprise us because Jesus has a way of always seeing people who are in trouble, of seeing people who are in need. And that is his MO all the time. He's constantly fixated on, he is zeroed in on people who nobody else sees. That's who he sees. You go to the very beginning of Luke. Think about Jesus' sermons. The first sermon Jesus preaches in Luke. He shows up at church, and nobody tells anybody there that he's going to be preaching the sermon. He just shows up and preaches the sermon, and he takes the Bible, and he flips it open to Isaiah, and he says, I'm going to preach a sermon, and it's about myself, and it's this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. The poor, the captives, the blind, those who are oppressed. That's who Jesus preaches about right at the beginning of his ministry. And it's the people that he sees. It's the people he's paying attention to. That's the first sermon in the Gospel of Luke. The first sermon in the Gospel of Matthew is the Sermon on the Mount. You remember how that begins? Blessed are the people who have it together. Mm -mm. Blessed are the people who are strong in their faith. Blessed are, no, no. Blessed are the people uh, who mourn. I am certain that there are people today here who are mourning. Maybe somebody who is sick in your life. Maybe somebody who is going to die. Maybe somebody who has died. Maybe you are mourning the state of this world, which is so beautiful and which is so completely broken and your heart is breaking for it. And Jesus says, here's the first sermon I'm gonna preach. It's for anybody here who has a heart that's breaking, who's mourning. And he says, those who mourn will be comforted. And you say, how is my heart gonna be comforted? He said, it will. And this is because Jesus not only passes by, he sees people who are in the margins. He's just completely obsessed with them. And the last thing I'll say about this first verse is that if you want to identify with a person in this passage, the person that you're supposed to identify with is the blind man. Because what's being said here is that you and I, all of us are spiritually blind in one way or another. And you might think, oh, that doesn't, that's not very good news and that's kind of demeaning. It's not demeaning at all because Jesus came for people who are broken. Jesus came for people who are blind. You get to the very end of this passage and some religious teachers, some pastors like me, they come up to Jesus and say, we don't like you that much. Uh, are you calling us blind? Because we're not blind. And Jesus says, if you said that you were blind, you wouldn't have any guilt. But because you say you're just perfectly fine, you are blind as could be. So here's what this means for each one of us to recognize and confess, I am blind. And I need somebody to come to me. And if you say, no, no, I'm not really blind. I need Jesus a little bit. I need Jesus a little bit to help me out. Then Jesus is going to probably help you out a little bit. But if you confess that you're blind and know that you need him in this way, then he's going to come. He's going to pass by and he's going to see you. That's the first verse. I'm not going to talk this much for all the verses. I'm not. Here is the second verse. And it's pretty striking. Jesus doesn't go alone to this man. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So Jesus is apparently not alone. He brings his disciples with him. And they see this man that is born blind. And they ask a question which is completely natural. And it's also a question which is a little twisted. They look at the guy and they say, ah, he's blind. All right, who sinned? Was it his parents that did this or was it him? And it's a strange question because think about this now. He's saying, they're saying, we see that this man has this, uh, this, this disease or something going on. So one of two things we know happened. Either his parents sinned and they're getting the penalty of a disabled child. That's what God did. Or what's really happening here is that he sinned somehow. When? If he was blind from birth. Some rabbis thought you could sin in the womb. And that would be the place or the time that you would be punished for your sins somehow. So this is the question that they ask. And as I describe this, I suspect that some of you are saying, like, that's a pretty, 
that's pretty twisted, to walk up to somebody that is, that is disabled, that is struggling, that is in pain, and you say, all right, who sinned? Okay, just pause for a second. That is a question that is natural, and it bubbles up in nearly all of us. Because think now, you have friends, you have family, you have people in your lives, and let's say you hear this story, you say, hey, did you know uh, so-and-so got divorced? They got divorced. They did? Oh, no. That's terrible. What happened? Well, who was it? Was it? You begin to ask questions. You say, oh, something really bad happened. And so you begin to, say, you begin to try to suss it out. You find out that somebody is sick or maybe even died. You hear in the news that a celebrity dies, and what do you say? Something happened. I wanna know what really happened. You hear that a friend lost their job, you say, I am so sorry. Do you know what happened? I, something happened, they did something. We automatically assume there is somebody at fault. We think so, somebody did something wrong. It's this thing that bubbles up in all of our hearts. There's a root of this in Judaism. It's in the book of Job. Job's life falls apart and his friends show up and for a while they keep straight faces and they mourn with him. They say, it's, oh, it's really terrible. This is really awful. We're so sorry. We're going to pray for you. What'd you do? You must have done something to have deserved this because you get what you deserve. There's a root of this in Judaism. There's a root of this in almost any anybody's heart or anybody's religion. Do you remember almost 20 years ago, there was a tsunami in, in Southeast Asia. And there was a, a news article about a week after this took place. It's in the Los Angeles Times, and it was a survey of all of the religious responses to the tsunami. I want to read to you just a little bit of it. Listen. They surveyed a bunch of people, and this is what was said. This is Los Angeles Times, January 8th, 2005. Ananda Guruj a former Sri Lankan ambassador to the United States who also teaches at a Buddhist affiliated university says, this is him from this article, the Buddhist doctrine of karmic law, not random chance, determines who lives and dies in any disaster. The tsunami region suffered collective bad karma, perhaps prompted by oppression, unjust war, or other negative actions that invited the calamity. In Sri Lanka and Thailand, both majority Buddhist countries, Hit by the tsunami, people tend to believe that those who perished were paying the price of accumulated demerits in this life or the previous. Guru said while the survivors were reaping rewards, Buddhist doctrine makes people responsible for their own fate. And the writer of this article mentions, and this is probably germane, that Guru's family largely survived in Sri Lanka. Okay, so that's the Buddhist take. This is a Buddhist teacher. This is the Hindu take. This is Nadadur Vardhan. I'm sure I'm getting that wrong, but the president of the Hindu Temple Society of Southern California. We all believe too many people were doing too many bad things. People haven't lived up to what they were supposed to do. What's the Christian view of why suffering happens? And we can find it out right here. Because Jesus' disciples say, okay, let's cut to the chase. Was it the parents or was it him? Look at verse 3. Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. I'm dragging this out because I've been a pastor for about 25 years, and I can't tell you how many people have come to me and said, I'm going through this horrible thing. I think it's because of something that I did. I'm going through this really, really horrible thing, or my child is going through this horrible thing, or my family. I think it's some, I, we haven't been going to church. We've, I, I totally forgot about it. I didn't. I turned away from it. That's why this is happening. In Jesus, here and elsewhere, he does make the connection between the fact that when we are disconnected from God, the brokenness of the world becomes even more broken. That's true. But he doesn't give us any license here to identify some suffering in our own lives and connect it to something we've done. And in fact, he gives something completely otherwise from that. He says, look, it wasn't that this man sinned, it wasn't that his parents sinned, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. And what that means is not that God made this guy blind so Jesus could go heal him. It just simply means that God likes to shine in the midst of our suffering. 
And so again, I'm dragging this out because right now I suspect some of you have come in some way or another and you say, I'm struggling, I feel broken, I'm wondering what's going on in my life. If you go to what Jesus says here, he says it's not because your parents sinned, it's not because you sinned, it's because God wants to show up in your life and bring light. That's it. That's all you can say from the teaching of Jesus here. Let's keep going, verse 4. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. And Jesus is highlighting two important things here. He's highlighting himself. He says, God sent me to do great things. He sent me to bring light. He sent me to do work. But do you see the pronoun that's used there? We must work the work. Who is he talking about? We must work. He's saying, God sent me so we can work. Do you know who the we is? It's all of us. It's all of his people. It's, it's this power that he gives to each one of his people to be a part of what he's doing in the world. He says what you do in your work and in your friendships and in your relationships and in your worship here on Sunday and in your social interactions, I want to use all of that. We're going to work together. And I'll say, there's this sort of ominous, he says, we have to work while it's still day. Night is coming when no one can work. There'll be a time when you will not be able to work together in joy with the things that God wants to do in your life through you to the people around you. There's a day coming when you won't be able to do that. Each one of our days are numbered, so you have today to figure out and say, oh man, I'd like to do that. Jesus is inviting you now. He'd like to connect you to the work that he's doing. And now you have it. You have the opportunity to do it today. Verse 5, Jesus says, as long as I am in the world, I'm the light of the world. He doesn't just say he's a light in the world. He doesn't say that he's one of a number of lights. He says he is the light. And I want you to see how he demonstrates that he is the light. Jesus says, I'm the light of the world in the, in the, in the, 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 the big, the, 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 lanterns are flaming, and it's this beautiful moment. He says, I'm the light of the world, and I'm going to show you how. Verse 6. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud. This is a, this is just a, this is for free. This is just instructional. If you come across something in the Bible, and you're like, that's really weird or kind of icky, but it just must have been the way things did, people did in the Bible times. That's not always the case. It's gross when someone spits in the dirt and puts it in your face. That's gross. And Jesus does it here. And he's showing us his light. I want to show you three things that are going on in this verse. He kneels down in the mud and he begins to play in the dirt. He's making mud pies. What is he doing down there? Here's the first thing. He's showing us that he's the creator. We've seen someone get down on their hands and knees before and scoop up mud. It's God in Genesis. In Genesis 2, God scoops up dirt and he puts it close to his mouth and he blows into it and he makes men and women in his own image. He says, this is how I'm going to create. And so now, many, many thousands of years later, Jesus scoops up dirt and he puts it close to his mouth. And he says, I'm going to recreate what's broken. He's showing here that he is the creator God. We've seen this before. You yourself did not create yourself. You did not create yourself. And I'll tell you this, you cannot recreate yourself either. You did not make it so that you have life. You can't make it so that you have eternal life to be restored. And Jesus is saying here, I've come to do it. He's kneeling down on the ground and he's blowing. That's the first thing you see that he's the creator. Here's the second thing you can see. He's kind of like a kid. He's making mud pies. I was at a party last night and all the adults were on one side of the house and all the kids were on the other side of the house. And the adults were doing adult things. We were talking about serious things and about business and we were, it was fun, it was great. And then I went over to the kids' side. Do you know what they were doing? They were drawing with crayons with this, you know, this grip like that. They were drawing with crayons and they were making um, little uh, crafts, and they were kind of running around. Jesus is on the kid's side of the house. He's making mud pies, and he's down there on the ground, and he is showing his glory. He's showing his glory by being on the ground and spitting and making little things with mud and then putting them on people's faces. 
And so here's the question that's being asked. Can the glory of God be shown in these little childlike expressions? Can God's love show up in your life when God does something that looks immature? You know, we've talked a little bit about Hinduism and Buddhism, right? Let's talk for a second about Islam. One of the central refrains of Islam is Allah Akbar, means God is great. And this is where Christians and Muslims completely agree. God is great. God is the greatest. He is the supreme. He's the most powerful. But here's the place where Muslims and Christians would disagree, is that Christians say God shows his greatness by getting on his hands and knees and playing in the mud. That God shows his greatness when Jesus comes to his disciples. He comes to them and he gets down on his hands and knees and he becomes a servant and he washes their feet. He becomes a slave and a servant. Philippians 2 says that he comes and he is great, but he gives up all that greatness. And he goes to the cross and his greatest strength is revealed in being a slave and dying a slave's death. So you and I can have a life that is only given by him, by his sacrifice. Jesus is the light of the world, and it comes in this really, really immature kind of way. Here's the third thing. This shows how Jesus works. Did you notice that this guy did not ask to be healed? He didn't ask to be healed. Jesus just shows up. He just heals him. He doesn't ask him if he believes. He doesn't ask him if he wants this to happen. And then if you go to verse 7, take a look at verse 7. He said to him, go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Jesus is kind of acting like an ER doctor or nurse. He's just moving frantically. He's doing all the things. And that's what ER doctors have to do. If you've ever been to an ER and somebody comes in and the doctor doesn't say, hey, I see there that you have a really grievous wound on your arm. I was wondering if you would like me to take care of that. And I'm sorry to say, for me to take care of it, I'm going to have to remove your shirt. Can we? No. The person just rushes over and cuts the shirt off and begins to act and begins to apply all the healing. And that's what Jesus is doing here. Sometimes Jesus' work is like that. He just is acting and he's moving and it might feel uncomfortable. When you are in the ER, it looks like chaos. But it's a physician moving towards you in love. Look at verse 8. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Others said, no, it's like him. He kept saying, I am the man. And this is where this man begins to act. He's had this grace and this love and this healing given to him. It's not something he asked for. It's not something that he went to Jesus in faith for. But now that he's been healed, he begins to be a witness to what Jesus has done for him. And he begins to testify to the beauty and the strength of Jesus in his life. Look at verse 10. They said to him, how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to him, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. He's been healed by the sent one. And now Jesus seemingly has sent him. And now he is proclaiming the truth to people who are coming and saying, what happened to you? We, we, this is very strange. You, that'll happen, by the way, to you sometimes. Those of you who are Christians, God will do things in your life and change your life. And people around you will be like, we do not recognize you. You seem really strange to us. That's what Flannery O'Connor said. She says, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you strange. When Jesus comes, he's going to make you strange in some way or another. But this man is a great example of what you and I are called to. And here's how I'll finish up. Because this man now, look at Jesus is not here. They don't know where he is. They say to this man, do you know where he is? No, we don't know. This man, I don't know where he is. The leaders, they don't know where he is. Jesus is gone, but he's still there. The light of the world is still there. And the reason I know that is because Jesus tells us that not only is he the light of the world, but you are the light of the world. Jesus looks at his people and he says, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill can't be hidden. And so when you can't see Jesus, Jesus sends out his people and he says, I'm going to go with you by my spirit. You're not going to be able to see me, but now I want you to be my eyes and ears and my hands. Jesus sees people that nobody else sees. He says, I want my people to see the people nobody else sees. Jesus brings healing and love. He says, I'm going to send my people out. I want you to bring healing and love. And you and I have the opportunity to do that, to be the light of the world. 
because Jesus gives us that gift. Friends, listen to this call from Jesus. He wants you to follow him, and then he wants you to go out into the world and to be the light of the world. He'll go with you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Our Lord Jesus, we give you thanks that you call us into the world and that we don't go on our own. Even when we don't see you, we know you are with us by your spirit. You call us out into the world to be your light. So help us to do that. Help us first to receive your light, to receive your love, to be healed by you of our blindness. Each one of us brings all kinds of different blindness. But we know you can heal us, and not only heal, heal us, but fill us with your power. We ask that you would help us to see ways that we can be your light to others. We pray that you would bring to mind for us now people who you're calling us to be witnesses to through words or through gestures or through actions or through prayer. Help us to bring your light into this world. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.